This was the case in our scripture reading today. Where was John? I noticed that the scriptures didn't say that he was in the Sanhedrin. He wasn't preaching in the church. Where was he? Now, you wouldn't think that preaching in the wilderness would be a good place to draw people's attention, would you? But here is the challenge that God has for human beings to think differently. And people left their normal place of worship and left their normal place of, of thinking about God and were drawn out into the desert place. And there was John. And did he have his collar on back to front and did he have a nice suit on? And according to you know, the Levitical uh, laws, did he, did he appear as uh, one who was normally someone who represented God? A bit different, wasn't he? Camel's hair. I guess it might have smelt a bit too. He was someone who certainly was different. And God had called him to speak a special message for his time because the kingdom of God was at hand. And he saw his message as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy where Isaiah made it clear that there would be a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the ways of the Lord. And John was certainly the voice that God chose for the people to hear in those times. I'm sorry I don't have my shiny suit on today but I'm about to get in the tank. So I'll wear my suit a little bit later. So maybe I'm trying to follow John the Baptist's uh, style of doing something different, not meeting the expectations that you might have. But here in this passage of scripture, we find that uh, one of the keynotes of this passage was that John was calling people to repentance. Did you notice that? The issue of repentance was the issue of his day. And it seems to me the closer we draw near to the kingdom of God, the more vital that issue is. And just as it was to prepare people to meet Jesus Christ in person in his first coming, I'd like to submit to you today, so it is that as people prepare for Christ at his second coming, the issue of repentance is going to be the issue one of the main issues amongst God's people is not that they, how good they are and how smart they look and how, how successful they are in business or whatever, but how humble are they in recognising that they too, though members of the church, though practising the ways of God, they too are sinners who need to repent. And so it is with your pastor as well. He needs to repent. Just check with his wife. <laughs> now when Jesus came to John, what was the note of repentance in Jesus? coming to John. Was there any repentance that he needed to profess? There's nothing in the record. And indeed there was no need for him to repent. He did not come to baptise because he needed to repent. There was another reason why he came to John for baptism. And we read it there in verse 3. No, not verse 3. Verses 13, 14 and 15. <clears throat> then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptised by John. 
But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you. And are you coming for me to baptise you? You should be baptising me. But Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfil all Exactly, rightness, righteousness. This last week I was studying with some folk who felt that they didn't need to be what they called rebaptized because they had been baptized as a child and the priest has sprinkled some water on them. I tried to indicate to them that it really wasn't what baptism was. Though the church has come to call it that, it's not what it is. Baptism is not a sprinkling of water. Baptism is a submersion. The Greek word baptismo means to fully submerge. And I tried to encourage them. Come. And... Uh, see how baptisms happen, see how baptisms take place. But you know it's very hard for people to change their traditions. It's very hard for people to change the way they've been thinking all their lives. And they have a, had a real wrestle with themselves as I explained to them this particular passage. What did Jesus, why did Jesus baptise? Why did John the Baptist baptise Jesus? Jesus says, baptise me, John, because this is the right thing to be doing. There's something about it, isn't there? And as we think about it, the Apostle Paul helps us to understand it a little better. That what Jesus was doing here was symbolically indicating what was to happen to him personally. He was going to die and he was going to be buried and he was going to be brought to life again. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that those of us who have been baptised, we've been baptised into his death and buried with him in his burial. That like as Jesus was raised from the dead that Sunday morning, so those of us who are baptised come up out of the water to a new way of life. So the issue of baptism has to do with a new life in Jesus Christ. Isn't that the good news? And if we have the opportunity to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever we do and say, isn't it a good thing for us to do that right thing, do you think? If Jesus says it's the right thing to do, isn't that a good thing and a right thing for us to do? It surely is. It's our opportunity to experience a closeness with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was fully immersed in the River Jordan and coming out of the water, something came upon him. What was it? If we notice the verses uh, following, at that moment, in verse 16, at that moment the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Not only was it the right thing to do, but it was something that the agencies of heaven were able to indicate a great blessing. The agencies of heaven were able to impart to this person who had been baptised in the River Jordan new power the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen him 
And we notice as uh, chapter 4 begins in Matthew that the Spirit of God led him into the desert. And we know what happened in the desert. He there fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. He was there preparing for his public ministry. He was there uh, to establish a, re a very close connection with his heavenly Father in preparation for the testing time of three and a half years of public ministry. And the Spirit of God descended on him in the form of a dove. Isn't that amazing? You know, as I've conducted hundreds of baptisms in Papua New Guinea, there hasn't been one baptism where the people have come to me and said, Pastor, did you notice this? Did you notice that? Did you notice this? The Papua New Guineans are very conscious of the power of God that is evidenced in the baptism experience. And the supernatural intervention is manifested in different ways. And to us who are the complicated Western mind, we might find some of these rather, rather trivial and rather laughable. But for those people in simple faith, as they saw these things happening before their very eyes, their faith was confirmed that God was moving in this experience. Just as God was moving in John the Baptist's experience here, the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. What a wonderful blessing, what do you say? But then there's more. The record goes on to say that a voice came from heaven. Now I wonder whose voice that might be. If Jesus is there in the water and the Holy Spirit has descended in the form of a dove, who's left? The Heavenly Father. And it's amazing to me that our Heavenly Father has the capacity to break through the corridors of space, to witness an event that is happening on planet Earth, a tiny little speck in the cosmos. And on this little speck, there's a human being who is submitting to the form of baptism of, of immersion under the water. That his voice could no longer remain silent and he cries out, this is my beloved son. Who is he? If there was any question in your mind about who Jesus Christ is, it should no longer be a question because the Father's voice has settled it once and for all. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, why would the Father's voice need to speak from heaven to indicate that he was pleased with his Son? Pray tell me. What had just happened? Jesus had submitted to the form of repentance and confession and the drawing of, uh, closer of a human being to God's kingdom. Jesus had said to John, suffer it to be so now for it's for us to display what the right thing to do is. And Jesus was buried in the water. And I believe the reason the Father's voice could no longer remain silent was because we have a fully grown adult male who has recognized his role on planet Earth to be the saviour of mankind and he willingly submitted to the fact that he was going to die, he was going to be buried and he was going to come back to, to life. In other words, the great plan of salvation that had been worked out before this world was created 
was now being put into place by the three members of the Godhead family, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? I would love to hear the Father's voice say to me, you are my son. And I'm so pleased with what you're doing. Wouldn't it be good to have the Father's voice say that? Don't you think? Absolutely. As we come over to Matthew chapter 28, we notice something else about the issue of uh, baptism. And I'd like you to turn just briefly to it. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28. And we notice that, uh, first of all, in verse 18, that um, <clears throat> Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I wonder why all authority has been given to him. Because he is one who has completely harmonised with the will of the Heavenly Father. Never missed a beat. He has fulfilled every aspect that was necessary for your salvation and mine. There needs to be not one person lost in the human family. Isn't that the good news? We all have the opportunity to embrace the kingdom of God and to be members of God's kingdom. Isn't that wonderful news? All authority has been given to me. And the issue of baptism has as its basis the experience of Christ and the authority that was given to him. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 18 of Matthew 28. Verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, Some folk have said to me, you know, Pastor, what are you doing here? We have our own church and we have our own pastor, we have our own priest. What are you doing? And I'm very pleased to tell them that God has commissioned those who believe in Jesus Christ to be disciple makers. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's our ministry, isn't it? To go and to make disciples. Now the problem is there's all kinds of disciples, or so-called disciples. But the disciple is one who needs to uh, understand he is following uh, the Saviour. And uh, the scriptures here tell us what it is that makes a disciple. What is it? Verse 19. Baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is how you make a disciple. When you lead a person to identify with what Jesus says is the right thing to do. To make all disciples. And then, what else in verse 20? And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Isn't that a challenge? How do we find about any, everything that Christ has commanded? How do we find that out? It's only as we read his word. As we understand the words of scripture, we will find what it means to be taught what it is that Christ commands. But it doesn't finish there. It says, and surely I am with you always to when? The very end of the age. And I tell you what, folks, the good news is we're not quite at the end of the age yet. Or is that the bad news? Some would say it's the bad news because we've been waiting to get into the kingdom of God for a long time, haven't we? My dear old dad thought it was going to happen in his day. And he's been sleeping for many years now. 
I hope it's in my day and I hope it's in your day. But we don't know. But one thing we do know is that the presence of Christ will be with us until the very end of the age. So whether we see the end or not doesn't matter. The presence of Christ is going to be with his people in this business of making disciples and encouraging people to learn and to understand the great teachings of Jesus Christ as found in his word. Isn't that the good news? And may that ever be our focus and ever be our goal as we live uh, in this day and age. So we need to understand that there is an imperative to go. To go and make disciples has some element of urgency about it because the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. Have you got that sense? Things are happening in our world, aren't they? Things that are really making us stop and think, what's going on? And things are coming to the climax and we need, to, we need to be serious about the business of going and making disciples. What is it to make a disciple? First of all, to baptise in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit as we will today, Dudley. And then teaching the disciples to observe all things taught by Jesus himself. And those learning of the teachings will last right up until uh, the end of the age. Now I've been a minister for some 46 years. I've been brought up in the church. I thought I knew everything when I left Avondale College. But becoming a minister in the church you soon learn you don't know everything at all. And church members are quite willing to teach you a thing or two. And even after 46 years, there's some church members who still believe they can teach the pastor a thing or two. <laughs> and my wife said, yes, and they can. Because we can continue learning. We can continue to understand the scriptures. And it's while I've been here in Penrith in these last couple of years, I have learned some new things about the Sabbath that I hadn't understood before. I'd read the passages so many times, but someone in this congregation helped me to see something I hadn't seen before. And that's the nature of Bible truth, isn't it? Now, Lynn, you've been a, a member of the church for many, many years, and it's still an ongoing path of understanding and learning more. And we should never think that we've come to understand everything that there is to know. We're just a little brain trying to understand God's word and to come close to God. We're only just beginning the process. But what a wonderful experience as we walk together to learn together, to understand together and to encourage each other in the process. What do you say? That's the nature of the church. And I'm so glad we all think differently. I'm so glad we can all see things a little differently to how uh, others see things. That's the way we can learn some things. And so today, it is my very special privilege to uh, conduct this baptism and to lead Dudley through the waters of baptism because I have been able to witness how he has searched the scriptures and how the scriptures have brought to him a whole new way of life. And it will do that for every one of us, no matter how long you've been in the church, no matter how long you've been a Christian, there is still power in this book to help us to grow more like Christ. What do you say? And we need to spend time in studying it so that uh, we can grow in spiritual strength. One thing to grow healthy physical bodies, 
but it's quite another thing to grow healthy spiritual, spot, spiritual bodies, to be strong in the Lord, to be strong in our faith, to be unwavering in our convictions as God leads us. And so this is not the end of our journey in the baptism experience of today, but it's rather part of the beginning process. And uh, I do pray that uh, this congregation will be ready uh, to stand alongside of new folk to encourage them because, you know, we live in a world where the forces of darkness are at play and they know how to attract human beings, don't they? The forces of darkness know how to trip us up and to get us thinking of different things. And we do pray that uh, as new folk come into the family of the church that uh, you will be conscious of being a friend, being someone who can uh, walk with them and to encourage them as they walk that journey.